Elaine Morgan's dramatization continues next Wednesday here on 2 at the same time, 9.25. In the meantime, you may like to know that the theme music is available on a BBC single. Tomorrow, the BBC television Shakespeare series presents Time and... Well, in 20 minutes, Newsnight. First on 2, a special arena programme recalling some of the best moments from the career of a man who once rivalled Chaplin and Keaton. The return of Lupino Lane. Lupino Lane is best remembered as the man who made the Lambeth Walk famous. When he died in 1959, that's what the obituaries mention. What most of them failed to recall was that Lupino Lane had once been a star of the silent screen, a comic who had rivaled Chaplin and Keaton. Like many English comics before him, he'd started his career in vaudeville, but soon left for Hollywood in the footsteps of Stan Laurel and Charlie Chaplin. Within a short period of seven years, he'd made well over 40 films. But by 1929, with the arrival of a talkies, his small studio was forced to close. The negatives of all the film were destroyed by fire, and most of the nitrate prints were sold for their silver content. It was only by accident in the mid-1960s that film historian Philip Jenkinson first came across a Lupino Lane film. After years of research, he's finally managed to track down and restore 14 of the original prints. And tonight's programme presents some of the best moments from that lost legacy of Lupino Lane.
Joyland marked the end of Lupino Lane's silent film career. When the studio closed in 1929, he returned to vaudeville. His real success in the movie business had come to an abrupt and unhappy end. From now on, he was to make only the occasional talking picture. Hey, ho. Life's a misery. I know. You agree with me. I'm the kind of guy. Good luck is always passing by. There is so much I want to do. But when I find my schemes fall through, who can I tell my troubles to but you? Oh, how? When things go wrong in what I've planned, nobody seems to understand. Nobody gives a friendly hand but you. Oh, how? I try so hard to make a name. I want to rise to wealth and fame. But people won't believe in me. They can't see fame for me. On Saturday, Arena looks at Superman, the comic strip hero who's made a few films of his own, meeting not only the current celluloid star, but also the first, not only his greatest living adversary, but also his creators. Superman, still going strong after 43 years of public existence, including an appearance on the cover of the new Radio Times out tomorrow, and in Saturday's Arena at 10 past 10, here on 2. In 10 minutes on BBC One, Robert Key opens a new series, a weekly look at what is new, controversial and entertaining in the world of paperbacks, including this week an interview with Douglas Adams, author of a recent successful series here on Two, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. In 45 minutes here on Two, Snooker and the quarterfinals from Sheffield, following Newsnight. It's a Japanese carving and it's known as the Masatame Monkey Group, or is it? This example is really the work of a master craftsman, but unfortunately, it's plastic. Newsnight tonight reports on some monkey business in the antiques world. We devote most of tonight's programme to a remarkable piece of detective work by Newsnight's Roger Cook, who at considerable danger to himself and his team has uncovered a startling story of sharp practice in the antique trade. We have a record of you actually saying that you passed off a Masatami monkey group for £700 at auction. We have a tape recording of it. Would you like to see the transcript of the tape recording? You would. Jolly good. Well, here's... Uh, I've got three men broke in my shop and mob they're, handed. They did not mob yeah, handed. Quick. And that encounter, as you will see, later came to blows. The Defence Minister has ordered a review of Britain's long-term defence programmes in an effort to see where savings can be made and equipment needs rethought as tactics change. As I'll be examining Mr Knott's white paper later in the programme. In Birmingham, an inquest on Barry Prosser, who died in a prison hospital, has decided that he was unlawfully killed. Kevin Cosgrove will be revealing the background to this disturbing case. And Marshall Lee has tonight's semi-final cup replay and the latest on the last day of the test by satellite from Jamaica. It's a criminal offence knowingly to sell an antique as genuine when you know it's not. 
We've all been diddled in our time, but in just one field of the antique market, the selling of ivory carvings, innocent buyers and sometimes dealers themselves are spending thousands of pounds on what they think is ivory, but really isn't. The trouble is that the line drawn between sharp practice and an honest mistake is not always that easy to perceive. But Roger Cook has uncovered both in this amazing report on just one corner of the world's antique trade. 60, 170. Going on. 170 pounds. Any more? 180. 180 pounds. Hold on. 180. Duclos. An auction at Christie's. Thank you. Today it's Japanese ivory carvings. Lot uh, 12. 130 pounds bid for this. In these inflationary times, many people try to protect their savings by investing in art. An increasingly popular buy over the past few years have been these ivory netsuki and okumono. They're good to look at, portable and profitable. 30, 230, 40. Fine pieces have gone up in value several hundred percent in recent years, outperforming almost everything else in the art market. And at this auction, even quite modest pieces fetched two and a half thousand pounds each. Thank you. And because these carvings have become such an attractive proposition, other smaller auctions up and down the country are being scoured for possible bargains. I went to an auction and um, seeing these in the catalogue, thought I might like to buy this piece, being a small collector of ivories. Um, managed to purchase it for a hundred pounds. Highly delighted. Phoned up a friend to say, "Look what I've got." You know, sort of thing. He said, "Oh, you know, He said, "Well, sorry, but I've got one as well, the same." He said, "But I paid seven hundred pounds for mine." Um, so we decided to go up to Christie's. Um, thought about getting them checked over. Took them up to Christie's. Said, "Yes, very nice, but." We've seen them all before, you know, they're, they're plastic. He said, but that one, not too sure about. Might be plastic, could be real. Took them and he said, you better go round to Sotheby's for a second opinion. Sotheby's said, yes, well, that one's not real, the darker one. He said, this one may be, which was my one, you know, highly delighted, possibilities. Um, eventually we'd check them over and know they were plastic, both plastic. No good at all. Although Christie's and Sotheby's take the greatest of care to ensure that goods sold by them are as described, even they do make mistakes. Local auctions and dealers without the benefit of as much experience or expertise make more mistakes. The catalogue from which Mr. Collins bought described his plastic copy as ivory. It's a trap for players of all ages. Here you see what appears to be a superb example of a group of monkeys by a very famous Japanese carver called Masatami. It's certainly the work of a master craftsman, but there's just one snag. It's the work of a craftsman in plastic. It's in fact a replica, and in fact it's, it's worse than that. It's a deliberate fake, I'm sorry to say, and designed to deceive members of the public. Why do you say that? Because these have been appearing all over the place and sold at widely varying prices, and there's not the slightest doubt that they're hoping that people will think they're ivory and perhaps pay around 800 pounds for them. In fact, the actual value is probably not more than 15 or 20 pounds. So how did you pick this particular one up? This one was spotted by our South Kensington sale room. How? They took it in as an ivory carving and they suddenly became slightly suspicious. I think it's the rather translucent effect round the eyes it looks a little bit odd. Also, there are one or two places where you can see there's no grain. So it almost fooled you. So what it chance... It nearly did, yes. So what chance has the general public got? I'm sorry to say that? very, very little. Unless they can look at hundreds, even thousands of ivories every year, as we do, there's not very much hope of them really getting their eye in. The Masatami monkey group that almost caught Christie's was advertised in a leading art and antiques magazine. The 
the firm that reproduces them and 160 other items is proud that their products are good enough to fool the experts, but deny that that's what they're designed to do. Duratone Limited say they can't be responsible for what happens to their products in other hands. These superb looking carvings are actually plastic. Those monkeys, the scrimshaw, a boat of fortune, a netski and a gamma senin cost only a few pounds to make, but if they were genuine, their total value would be well over 2,000 pounds. The little gamma senin by Gogetsu has spawned an army of plastic replicas, one of which found its way into our hands. You could have ours for 15 pounds. Other people wanted rather more. Shortly after acquiring this little moulded masterpiece, we found another one identical to it inside this uh, well-patronised Kensington antique market. The man who had it for sale wanted £200. But when we showed him this and pointed out that this, like his, was a plastic fake, he promptly offered to reduce his price by half. Later, he changed his mind and said he'd known it was a fake almost from the start, but was naturally trying to recoup his money. And then, shortly after that, we discovered yet another one. That's very nice, the one next to it. And that's six hundred pounds. Uh, have a look, please. That's the yard of diamond. That's lovely. Simple. Could you tell me something about it? No, I think I can't help you. Hmm? I can't help you anything. It's how much did you say? Six hundred. How old is it? I don't know. Well, it must be. Uh, you must have some They're idea. Nineteenth century. Nineteenth century, and it's. Uh, it's genuine. Mm. It is. Would it uh, surprise you to know then that uh, I have another one just like it? And that that is probably a forgery. I don't know. It's not mine. I'm just selling it. Well, who are you selling it for? Somebody. This is plastic. Is it? Yep. This looks plastic. That doesn't look. No, they are, that's plastic. We know where the original is. And these are identical. If you put them side by side, they're absolutely identical. Absolutely. Hmm? No, exactly the same size. No, they're exactly the same size. All right, you leave me a card. No, no, would, you, would it be a good idea to take it out so that nobody else is uh, perhaps persuaded to spend I'll £600 pounds on fifth? All right, I'll do that. Why don't you do it now? Look, that is my stall, and I know what I happened to do. You don't have to instruct me. But it is a forgery. All right. You agree it's a forgery? I have to test it. Well, we know it is, because we know where the original is. All right. I said that. I know that it's forgery. You do know it's a forgery. Yet you wanted £600 for it. Yes, at the moment. We have no, no guarantee, of course, she won't sell it to someone else for £600. Nor would she be short of replacements. Oh, I know. I'm entitled to take pictures, ma'am. All right, I know. One of the main distributors for these fine plastic products by Duratone is a man called Christopher George Harris, who trades on a national and international scale from his antique shop in Brighton. Here he is in a secret recording made by a potential customer who was told Harris could supply genuine replicas of anything the customer wants. What sort of age bracket would you put on these, Chris, from a sale point of view? Well, from an antique point of view, yeah. they're, they're 1900 items. Well, you know. 1900 items. We put one of those in one of those notes. Yeah. We've got seven of them. One of those monkeys. Did you? Yeah. And that was supposed to be Japanese, isn't it? Yeah. You see, I think the idea of this is to show you you can have, if you order yeah. enough of it to make it worth our while and yours, you can have what you like. It's good enough and potentially profitable enough to make even the most experienced of dealers, let alone members of the public, go against what might otherwise be their better judgment. I've been in the antique business all my working life and hopefully don't make too many mistakes in my own field, but it's easy enough to in other fields. And the reason for making them is almost always pure greed. <laughs> um, I saw that bit of what I thought was Scrimshaw sitting in uh, a back corner of a small shop in Derbyshire and uh, 
pretended not to have seen it, looked around at all the other things and asked a few prices and then casually said, well, what about that thing on the wall? And um, the dealer selling it didn't tell me what it was. In fact, I didn't want him to suggest that he might know what it was. <laughs> and um, gave me a price, which was 150 pounds. And I bought it without quarrelling and thought to myself, 1,000 pounds profit, more perhaps, and took it off and put it in my car. I was driving along the road feeling very happily and then suddenly, without looking at it again, I thought, oh, it's plastic, <laughs> has to be plastic. In fact, I was wrong, apparently they're fibreglass. <laughs> Can I look at that one there? He's not the only dealer who's been fooled. We found one in Camden Passage Antique Market who didn't know he'd been fooled. The, uh, the little boat over there. Hmm. Oh, it's just... Could you tell me something about it? 19th century copy of an early... They're Okimono. I mean, they've got the holes in them as though they're Nitsky, but they're not. Mm. You know, they were just made as... Okimono, small ivory carving. Mm. It's real ivory, though? Yes. Mm. How much is it? £120. Mm. Would, it, uh, would it surprise you to, to see that I have an identical one, which is plastic and cost £15? Jesus. Yeah. Oh, it's a My name's Cook from the BBC Television Newsnight programme and uh, like to know your reaction to that. They are identical. Actually, there's only one way that you can uh, tell these, and that's to put a red-hot needle in them. Red-hot needle in them, mm-hmm. And you've not done that with no, yours? it's bought in auction as an ivory, and that's that. So you'll be having words with them, will you? Colour goes Do on. Do you want to look through and see if you've got any more there? Well, that's the only one we know of. What is, is that a, a specific one that they're turning out? Oh, I mean, they're turning out dozens of them. Little monkeys, a man with a rat. The monkeys I've seen, the, the group of monkeys I've seen. So, what are you going to do with yours now? Take it out. <laughs> and go back and see the people who sold it to you? Well... What did you give for it, do you remember? Uh, about 70 pounds, I suppose. I think. You have this one for 15. <laughs> You've shattered my confidence. There was bad news, too, for another dealer right next door down this little alley. He'd bought a plastic monkey group for several hundred pounds. And once again, if they were fooled, what chances the general public, who flocked to places like London's famed Portobello Road Market in droves? Our inquiries there revealed numerous dealers who were, knowingly or unknowingly, selling exactly the same replicas for a wide range of prices. So everything's a copy, is it? Um, no, no, I didn't sell everything. You were talking about specific things, I told you. No. Christopher George oh, Harris has been selling there too. It's very good, whatever it is. And by the time buyers who complained to us found out what they'd really bought, it was too late. Inquiries elsewhere led us to a private detective called Michael Comer, who'd had a very interesting chance meeting last year with a drunken Dutchman on an aeroplane. Well, Initially, he said that he had an antique shop in, in Middle Street in Brighton. And then when he, he said that he was making £5,000 a day, that sort of raised my curiosity. And we started, I started to talk to him then about sort of other possible business interests he had. And then he mentioned he had this uh, factory in Hastings that was producing fake ivory antiques. And the conversation went on for really the whole duration of the flight. Um, 